Hello and welcome back to Neo Psychology with me, your teacher, Mr. Neo, the online channel where I teach you psychology to my wonderful students. Today, we're continuing with Research Methods Year 1 Content Lesson 2, Control of Variables. Let's get started. Here we go. Starter. Think back to our investigation from last lesson regarding whether energy drinks such as Red Bull make you more talkative. Other than drinking Red Bull, what are some other factors that may cause someone to be more or less talkative? What are some other factors that might cause someone to be more or less talkative? Are you talkative? Are you not so talkative? Are you more quiet? Why? Why are you like this? Is it personality? That might be one variable. Any other things? Maybe you, you, know, you were up until 6 in the morning again, so you came to lesson all tired, so therefore you weren't very talkative. There's another variable. Anything else? Maybe. Let's have a look. It's important though, what we need to do is control these variables because our investigation, we want to find out whether it's the Red Bull that causes talkativeness. So we want to control any other variables like the ones we discussed. Let's get started, shall we? Here are our learning objectives for today. Number one, show comprehension and apply knowledge of extraneous and confounding variables. Learning objective two, to identify and analyze demand, demand characteristics. And learning objective three, to understand investigator effects. What are these three things? Oh, we're going to find out. Let's start with learning objective one, show comprehension and apply knowledge of extraneous variables. Invariably, oi oi, studies in psychology involve a trade-off between control and realism. The greatest control can be achieved in a laboratory. However, it is debatable to what extent findings from the laboratory can be generalized to other environments, especially the less controlled environments in which everyday life is lived. Some psychologists argue that we can only discover things about behavior if we uncover cause and effect relationships in highly controlled laboratory experiments. Other arguments that, uh, others argue that studies in the natural environment are the only real option for psychologists who are, in, who are interested in how life is actually lived. In any experiment, there will, be, there will always be a number of unwanted factors that can potentially affect the relationship between the independent and dependent variables, spoiling or distorting the results in the process. What we want as psychologists is we want any changes at all to the DV, the dependent variable, to only be changed by the IV, the independent variable. So in our, in our experiment, we, aren't, we want any changes of talkativeness to only be because of whether they drank Red Bull or not, or the amount of Red Bull they drank, right? Any other variable we want to control, we want to minimize that. Fortunately, psychologists are aware of the issue and have devised several different ways of tackling these problems, some of which we shall explore here today. Extraneous variables, what are these? The key to an experiment is that an independent variable is manipulated or changed to see how this affects the dependent variable. The only thing that should influence the dependent variable is the independent variable. Any other variable that might potentially interfere with the IV or the DV should be controlled or removed. These additional unwanted variables are called extraneous variables and where possible, are identified at the start of the study by the researcher who then takes steps to minimize or remove their influence if possible. Many extraneous variables are straightforward, such as, such as the age of the participants or the lighting in the lab, etc. These are described as nu uh, nuisance variables. They do not vary systematically with the IV. So someone's age, for example, to use our Red Bull experiment, the age of someone might affect their talkativeness 
and that would be an extraneous variable. Therefore, we have to minimize this variable, so either have two groups of people with a similar age, or have everyone be the same age, so we know that the reason why they're more or less talkative is not from a variable such as age. These may muddy the experimental water, so to speak, but do, uh, but do not confound the findings of the study. They may just make it harder to detect a result. For example, to use our investigation of whether drinking energy drinks makes people more talkative, some of the confounding variables the experimenter may try to minimize between the two conditions are the age of the participants, as we suggested, the gender of the participants, maybe males are more talkative or females are more talkative, right? That's something we might need to control. We can control this by putting, you know, either all having a one, uh, a one gender sample or maybe having an equal number of genders in two different, uh, in the two experimental groups. And the IQ of the person, maybe the IQ, maybe if you're less intelligent, you talk more. There's lots of different variables you need to control in your experiments. These are all extraneous variables which may affect the amount someone may talk, the DV, but become confounding variables if we find that the extraneous variables hasn't been controlled for and doesn't affect the amount the participant talks, the DV, and does affect the amount the participant talks. So extraneous and confounding variables are essentially the same thing, except the confounding variables are the variables that haven't been controlled for and affect the amount the participant talks or the DV, whatever it is. Confounding variables. Confounding variables do change systematically with the IV. Let us imagine in our energy drink study, we have 20 participants in total and decide to use the first 10 participants who arrive for the water condition, the control condition, only drinking water. It happens that these first 10 participants are some very shy, introverted individuals. Our next 10 participants for the Red Bull condition are all quite extrovert types, very loud and outgoing, very talkative. An unfortunate coincidence, you say, but this coincidence means that we have ended up with a second unidentified IV, personality. So when we come to analyze our results and find that the Red Bull group were chattier, it can't be sure, we can't be sure if this is because of the drink of the Red Bull or is it because of their participants of the, of the, the personalities of the participants? Personality is a confounding variable. If our extrovert types had been spread evenly between the two groups, it wouldn't matter, though it would be worth controlling just in case. The problem was that the extroversion varied systematically with the IV and this alone could change the dependent variable. Extraneous variables and confounding variables are pretty much the same thing. Confounding variables are the extraneous variables that the experimenter didn't control for. So the extraneous variables are anything that could be anything and the confounding variables are the variables that we didn't control for in the experiment. It's the ones that you found afterwards. They're the confounding variables. Here we go. Let's define extraneous and confounding variables. It's not easy, but we need to know these two things. Any variable, so extraneous variable, any variable other than the independent variable that may have an effect on the dependent variable if it, if it is not controlled. Yes. EVs are essentially nuisance variables that do not vary systematically with the IV. Confounding variables, however, are any variable other than the IV that might have effect that might have affected the DV. So we cannot be sure of the true source of the change to the DV. Confounding variables vary systematically with the IV. Whew. Does that make sense? Good, because we're going to answer a question on it now. <laughs> Application question, extraneous variables. In a properly conducted experiment, it is important that potentially uh, potential extraneous variables 
are identified during the design of the study and appropriate steps are taken to control them. Question one, come up with at least 10 extraneous variables that would need to be controlled in the energy drink study. Two, which of the extraneous variables you have listed would be easy to control uh, and which would be more difficult? And three, take five of the extraneous variables you have listed and explain what steps you would take to control them. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of potential extraneous variables that you can come up with. So the answers that I've given are 10 examples. So in our experiment with the energy drink one, the amount of energy drink given to the participants, uh, the personality of the participants might be a confounding variable. Number of people in the room after drinking, of course, because that will depend. If there was only one person in the room, you might not talk to them. If there's lots of people, there's lots of opportunities to talk. Whether participants are friends with other people present, uh, present. Yeah, if I knew someone there, I'm obviously going to talk loads more. The age of the participants, the gender, the mood of the participants, whether they had had energy drinks before the experiments, the temperature in the room maybe, and any distractions. These are all potentially extraneous variables. Which of the extraneous variables listed would be easy? The most, uh, or difficult, the most difficult to control would be personality. Because personality is quite a difficult thing to operationalize. How can you define someone's personality, right? I can't take their word for it. Oh, I'm an introvert. I don't care what you say. I'm, a, I'm working with facts here and science. So you might be able to give them a personality test, but, you know, that's going to waste time and money. And, uh, you know, it's, they're going to keep them longer. Maybe you have to pay them more. So that, that, that is something you can control, but it might be more difficult to do that. Um, how will you control for the five easiest ones? Gender, you could evenly spread the, the male and female between the two groups. Or gender fluid, I don't know, it might be non-binary. The age, you might just, just use A-level students, that's quite easy. Or just use university students, which a lot of experiments do. Um, the consumption of other energy drinks. Monitor participants drink before the experiment. Did you drink anything before? No, brilliant, good. Did you? Yes, can't use you then, mate. Um, the amount they drink, each participant can drink one can or have a measurement, so you measure how much, so everyone's drinking the same amount. You know, you can't compare someone that took a sip and someone that's drunk three cans of it, can you? And then the temperature, if you keep the room temperature constant, then that should be easy to control as well. Here we go, that's extraneous and confounding variables. That was a long one, but we got there. Identify one thing you learned about extraneous and confounding variables. We learned loads. Why do you think learning about extraneous and confounding variables is important? Why is this important? It's important for our experiments because if you make research, and trust me, there is loads of research out there with ridiculous amounts of extraneous and confounding variables, and they still publish their results, and people are like, oh my goodness, did you read this experiment? It said that people that eat chocolate lose weight. That's rubbish. That is absolute bullshit, right? How does extraneous and confounding variables apply in real life? Well, if you need to conduct experiments, if you're reading pieces of ex uh, pieces of research, right, you need to look at the research, uh, at the experimental design, see how they control these variables. If they didn't, then maybe they uh, then then how do you know that the results are true? And you won't know. What questions has experimental and confounding variables raised for you? What are you still wondering about? You got any questions? Write them down. Ask me at a later point. Right. I made that. <laughs> Dependent variable, the researcher, extraneous variables. There we go. Um, Learning objective one, forgot I did that. Show comprehension and apply knowledge of extraneous and confounding variables. Are we happy to tick that off? Have we shown comprehension? Do we know what they are and have we applied knowledge of it? Yes, we did a question on it. Yes, tick it off. Learning objective two, identify and analyze demand characteristics. Ooh, demand characteristics, sounds cool. What is this? Let's find out. Demand characteristics. Participants are not passive within the experiments, within experiments, and are likely to be spending much of their time trying to make sense of the new situation they find themselves in. As such, participant reactivity is a significant extraneous variable in experimental research and one that is very difficult to control. In the research situation, participants will try and work out what is going on. 
certainly clues may help them interpret what is going on, on uh, what is going on these clues or cues are the demand characteristics of the experimental situation and may help the participant to second guess the experimenter's intention as well as the aim of the study so to use our example of the red bull maybe i've got a load of participants sat there i've given half of them red bull half of them not and then i'm st i'm stood there in the room and i'm giving little ticks doing a little tally of everyone when they do it and when they say a word somebody might sit there and work it out what they've done and maybe they'll sit there and say nothing or maybe they'll sit there and say loads of words because they might have worked it out or they might have understood somewhat of the experiment and that will affect the dv that will affect the results Participants may also look for cues to tell them how they should behave in the experimental situation. They may act in a way that, that they think is expected and overperform to please the experimenter, the please you effect, right? Or they may deliberately underperform to sabotage the results of the study, the screw you effect. Either way, participants' behavior is no longer natural and uh, and uh, an extraneous variable that may affect the DV, right? So this is even more significant in a laboratory study rather than a natural experiment. We're going to talk about these differences later on. But in a lab experiment, you're very aware that you're in an experiment, right? Usually the thing that they're asking you to do is not very natural. It's not a very natural thing to do. It's not normal in everyday life situation. You know, when is, ever, when is, when is anyone asking you to drink a really specific amount of Red Bull and then sit you in a group and then and then and then observe you it's not something that happens every day well, not all the time in my life only on weekends no. um, so demand characteristics it's any cue from the researcher or from the research situation that may be interpreted by participants as revealing the purpose of the investigation this may lead to a participant changing their behavior within the research situation. So, um, an example I would like to give is, it's not a perfect example, but um, I remember when I was young, I would go to the dentist, and then the dentist would want to see if I'm brushing my teeth correctly. So give me a toothbrush, a mock toothbrush, and they'll go, right, do you want to brush your teeth? And I'm like, yeah, right, sure. And I'll brush my teeth. And then they'll give me the solution and they'll see where I didn't brush my teeth, right? And they'll go, oh, you brush your teeth really well. Well done, you covered everything. I'm thinking, yeah, of course, because when I'm doing it in front of the dentist, I'm doing it well good. But this isn't how I usually do it, right? So I did demand characteristics. I acted in the way which I thought the, the, the researcher, or in this case, just the dentist. This wasn't a piece of research, which is why it's not the best example. But you get what I'm saying, right? I acted in a different way than I would have done in real life, right? They go brush your teeth. I'm like, I'm in front of the dentist. I'm gonna brush my teeth really well. Like, and they and then they checked off. It was really good. Well done. I was like, yeah, of course. I don't usually do it like this. I'm usually in and out, bang. But this is this is how this is a, this is an example of demand characteristics in an experiment. People might um, they might behave in a certain way that they believe is in demand from the experiment. They might behave in a way that. Uh, isn't normal of their everyday life and this is a type of extraneous variable something that you might have to try to control demand characteristics are all the cues which convey the participant the purpose of the study suggest possible sources for these demand characteristics try and think of at least four for example what the exper what the participant may already have heard about the study for example from one part from from other participants difficult question let's have a look at some of the answers the actual communication during the study the instructions and any implicit cues from the non-verbal communication so any cues potentially that might make them understand what the experiment might be about what the participants may already have heard about the study for example from other participants maybe they knew someone that already did the study and they came out and they told them afterwards oh it's actually about this the way the participant is approached initially and asked to volunteer the type of person the researcher is, whether, the, uh, whether uh, for example, if he or she is formal or relaxed and so on. So if you're a really formal one, you come in, you're going to be like really strict, like, oh yeah, I'm not going to do anything, blah, 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 and I'm not going to act normal. If someone's really relaxed, you might be like really easy. And the setting, 
of course, the setting will be a big effect, especially in lab experiments. If you're in a laboratory or somewhere that's very controlled and somewhere unfamiliar to you, then you're going to you're, you're likely to act differently than you would in a natural setting. And that's demand characteristics, right? That's quite simple. You just you you change the way in which you behave according to the cues of the experiment or the experimenter. Identify one thing you learned about demand characteristics. What's one thing you learned? Why do you think learning about demand characteristics is important and how does it apply in real life? Because uh, you need to understand that people don't always act as they should do. And this is something you need to take into consideration when doing an experiment or conducting a piece of research. What questions has demand characteristic raised for you? What are you still wondering about? You got any questions? Write them down. Let me know. There we go. That's learning objective two. Identify and analyze demand characteristics. And we have completed it. Check. Learning objective three to show understanding of investigator effects now. Investigator effects. Participants' reactivity also leads to investigator effects. Consider this. It is possible that during our energy drink study, we are recording the words spoken by each participant. We may be inclined to smile more during our interactions with some participants than others. Given that we are expecting the energy drink group to speak more than the water group, we may unknowingly, in our unconscious behaviour, encourage a greater level of chattiness from the energy drink participants, right? So it's the effects of the experimenter or the researcher, right? So I'm the experimenter. I've got the... Um, the control group that's only drunken um, water, I've brought them in. I go, right, come and take a seat in this room, please. Uh, you've got five minutes. And then I leave. Or I'll stay there, obviously. I've got to count the words. But I'm like that. I'm really strict. Whereas I might get the, the experimental group with the Red Bull, and I'm wanting them to talk more. So I go, come in, guys. Come in. Make yourself comfortable. Take a seat. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna um, stand here for five minutes. Don't worry what I'm doing on my clipboard. But, um, you know, feel free to do whatever you want. And... That might lead them to talk more. This is an investigator effect. I'm manipulating the findings, maybe unconsciously, maybe consciously. Maybe I'm an evil experimenter and wants my thing to be found. This is an example of an investigator effect, which refers to any unwanted influence of the investigator on the research outcome. As who? As Hugh Kulikan, who? Hugh. Who? We're not doing this. Points out, this can include expectancy effects and unconscious cues, such as those described above. It might also refer to any action of the researcher that were related to the study's design, such as the selection of the participants, the materials, the instructions. You know, maybe I chose the participants that I thought looked the most chatty before to be to go put into the, to the Red Bull uh, experimental condition. Leading questions as well, which are discussed in relation to eyewitness testimony, are a good example of the power of investigator effects. This is something we will look at in more detail later. Investigator effects. Again, another gap pull. Let's complete the definition. Come on, we can do this. Do it as well. Don't be lazy. Don't just leave it for me. Any effect of the participants, investigators, um, behaviour, conscious or unconscious on the research outcomes, the DV. This may include everything from the design of the study to the selection of an interaction with participants during the research process. Here's a question. Suggest how the following studies may be affected by demand characteristics and investigator effects. Number one, a group of students is interviewed. A group of students are interviewed about their belief in superstitions. The aim of the study is to see if there is a difference between male and females in the degree to which they are superstitious. Number two, researchers are investigating whether students work more diligently in a maths lesson than in general studies lesson. They give very similar worksheets to do with everyday finance to the same students in each of these two lessons. And three, teenagers in a youth club are observed to see if girls are more cooperative than boys. So let's have a look. In the question one, 
Good positions is interviewed about their belief in superstitions. The aim of the study is to see if there is a difference between males and females to the degree in which they are superstitious. Here's an answer. Demand characteristics. Whether students recognize that the questionnaire is, con uh, is concerned with superstitious behavior and change their answer to suit the impression that they would like to give. That's either they, they are or they are not superstitious regardless of the truth. So the demand characteristics, they might think, oh, they're asking about superstition. They may, maybe they want me to be more superstitious or exaggerate what I'm doing. Or maybe they want me to undersell it and show them I'm not superstitious, right? And essentially they're not acting truly. Or investigator effects, it might be the way the interview is conducted. Are men and women interviewed differently by tone of voice, etc.? Uh, and would this influence their response? Number two, researchers are investigating whether students work more diligently in a maths lesson than in a general studies lesson. They give very similar worksheets to the same students in each of these two lessons. Demand characteristics. The students may work out the purpose of the study because they have a similar exercise given by the same researchers in two different lessons. This may influence their behavior. They may, for example, work harder in the maths lesson because they feel they should when they will be an observed, right? Maybe something is given the, the purpose of the study way or the aim. Investigator effects. The investigator may unconsciously communicate that they expect students in one lesson to work harder than in the other, and this could in turn affect how hard they actually work regardless of the type of lesson. And then number three, teenagers in a youth club are observed to see if girls are more cooperative than boys. Demand characteristics. If observed, this ob if observation is not discreet, the participants may be behave in such a way as to give a certain impression. Their behavior will be affected by people by being watched. Yes, if they know they're being watched, they might not act naturally. And then investigator effects. The, investiga the, investiga the investigator may expect boys and girls to behave differently with respect to cooperation e.g. the girls will be more cooperative than boys and this may affect what behavior is interpreted as cooperative and what is not how do you measure cooperation is it standardized has it been operationalized you know you might you might interpret the girls behaviors as being really cooperative and the boys as not being cooperative even though they might have acted the exact same they would that would be an example of investigator effects Okay, identify one thing you learned about investigate effects. Why do you think learning about investigate effects is important? Because it can affect the results of the study. If there has been investigate effect in the study, you know, can we really generalize the findings? Can we take um, the results as valid and reliable? How does investigate effects apply in real life? Well, these, these might apply in studies that we that help us understand people better. You know, we have lots of research that's helped us with our understanding of human behavior. What if there were investigator effects in these? How, can, how much can we really trust them? And what questions has investi uh, investigator effects raised for you? What are you still wondering about? There we go. Learning objective three. Show understanding of investigator effects. Done. Tick. We're on to the plenary. Right. Create flashcards for some of the following key terms. Aim, hypothesis, independent variable, dependent variable, operationalization, extraneous variables, confounding variables, demand characteristics, and investigate effects. Make some key term flashcards for these, right? They're really good to have. You can do a piece of paper, cut them off, or go and buy some cards. It's really easy. And they're quite good for revision as well. And there we go. There's the lesson for today. Um, um, next lesson, we're continuing with control of variables. Um, thank you for um, thank you for attending today's lesson. You've been brilliant. Well done, my neo psychologist. Great work today. Keep up the good work. Make some notes for to letter for next lesson. I've been Mr. Neofitu. Great work. I'm off. Peace. God bless. I'm feeling like Will. I feel like a prince. I'm feeling myself. I'm loaded with bills. Cause I was not blessed with no uncle Phil. Don't know how it feels. I wanted to flex. They told me to chill. I'm making a flip. My life is a flick. Now load up the flip. Yeah.